welcome to the Tauranga Chamber of Commerce Thought Leadership Series. Today's topic is on the construction sector. It's very timely after these, uh, after last night's news, particularly after Fletcher's have made their announcements, and I'm really looking forward to hearing our expert panel's uh, thoughts and opinions. Uh, so, of course, this is uh, not so much um, a moaning session. This is very much around looking forward and what needs to happen. And, of course, we've had a number of, uh, number of themes. Uh, this is our fourth one, I believe. Uh, and we've focused on different sectors. And, of course, construction is going to be critical to help us build our way uh, out of this recovery. I'll introduce our three panellists. But before I do, for those that are attending, feel free to... Um, uh, ask us questions as we go through. There's a chat box as well as a QA. and a And um, yeah, we look forward to hearing some questions from you and we'll put um, some of them uh, to the panelists. Firstly, I would like to introduce uh, Peter McCaw. He is the general manager for Hawkins uh, and which covers the, um, particularly in the Bay of Plenty and Waikato. I've got a note here, it says, it's probably worth noting that I live in Tauranga and Hawkins have been particularly active in Tauranga with uh, about, um, half a billion dollars worth of projects delivered over the last two years, all currently in, in the pro process. Uh, welcome, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we have uh, been quite busy. Hawkins, obviously, is a national company, a uh, tier one builder, um, but we've been particularly busy in Tauranga over the, over the past couple of years with some big projects like the um, Tauranga Crossings, uh, the Waikato University campus down on Durham Street there, and Zest Rebuilding, and, Obviously, got a big, big project on the go at the moment, which is the farmers' redevelopment. And there's a couple of couple of tower cranes there that grace the skyline, um, which is good to see. And obviously, um, they, these projects are back up and running after the uh, after the sort of the COVID shutdown. We're we're back on site at farmers. There's probably a hundred people on that site at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's certainly it's certainly an interesting time in uh, in the commercial. Um, in the commercial construction um, industry at the moment and, and generally the wider construction sector. And um, there's still a lot of unknowns at this stage. Um, we, could, uh, we could see a glut of projects come into the market with um, the government response. And I guess there's a lot, of, a lot of businesses eagerly waiting to see how the government responds to the construction sector um, with that regard as well. Um, there's also a lot of nerves as well. Um, private clients, some projects have gone on hold, um, and that affects uh, that affects a lot of things. Downstream businesses, um, subcontractors. So, yeah, it certainly is interesting times, Matt. Yeah, look, th thanks for that, uh, Peter. Yeah, no, there's there's a couple of topics that I think we'll cover off in the in the conversation very shortly. I'd like to introduce now Morgan Jones, who is of course uh, the managing director at uh, Veros, um, and of course Veros is extensive across both the Waikato and Bay of Plenty. Um, and yourself, you've worked uh, right across a Australasia, by the looks of it, Morgan. Um, thanks for joining us, and uh, yeah, feel free to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. Um, yeah, re really looking forward to the conversation. Any any questions as we go? Uh, certainly, as as Peter said, unprecedented times, um, and and the the development construction se uh, sector is certainly really dynamic at the moment. So, if you ask a question today, the answer might be different in two weeks' time. So, there's certainly an element of crystal ball gazing at the moment. I mean, Peter said that there's a lot of uncertainty and a bit of nerves in the market. So. I think now that we're all back at, uh, well, not everyone, but a lot of the industry is back at work under level three, we're just uh, hoping that things will settle down a little bit and provide a little bit more clarity on, on what's ahead. But yeah, looking forward to talking about it today. Great. Th thanks, Morgan. Um, and our third uh, panellist is Peter Cooney. Peter's the director of the Classic Group, which incorporates Classic Builders, CBC Construction, uh, and Classic Developments, and Classic Life. Um, welcome, Peter. Thanks, Matt. Um, good to be here. I'll, uh, I won't, uh, I won't um, go into any detail on anything. I'll just wait for the questions and get into, uh, you know, we are in, entering into some very, very challenging times. Um, and some of us have been through previous uh, downturns. I think this is going to be as good as any downturn we're going to get. Um, so the challenges are going to be there. And um, we've got developments right throughout the country. So uh, we're certainly, uh, certainly on our toes as to 
what we're going to have to do and how we're going to uh, face the next 12 months because I think we're in, uh, we haven't seen the real the real hurt yet that's yet to come. Um, so we've uh, we've got we've all got some challenges in this industry going forward. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, so following on uh, the news from Fletcher's last night, uh, they had obviously laid off 1,500 staff across Australia and New Zealand, uh, with a thousand of their staff um, of New Zealand staff being laid off. Uh, is it is it quite interesting to know that uh, with a lot of government infrastructure and a lot of government projects coming in the pipeline um, and facilitated with state homes, uh, state uh, social housing buy up, is it an uh, odd time to be letting staff go or what, what messages does that send to the private market? Yeah, look, maybe I can, I'll, I'll just answer that first, if you like. I, look, it's, it's to be expected um, when you go through these downturns. It's a confidence thing. Um, you're going to see, a, a, I, I'm predicting you'll probably see a, a, up to 50 percent decrease in the, in the residential consenting process coming up. We've all gone, come back to work. And we've all got a lot of work, uh, you know, uh, work ahead of us. Um, but it's, it's, it's the current market or the current sales in the construction industry the sales that we do now or have done in the last five weeks and going forward will affect us in four or five months' time. And that's when the real hurt's going to come in. But, the you know, you had $136 billion of, of applications for the Crown Infrastructure Fund and there's only $3 billion being released. So it's going to be a real lolly scrambled out there. Um, and it will all take time before that kicks off. The, you know, governments are great at talking it up, but they're very slow at... Um, and actually progressing or releasing these projects. So um, that'll all take time. It'll certainly help. There's no question it'll help. Um, interest rates are going to help compared to 08, um, but you're certainly going to see a, a, a huge reduction in, the, in the, both the commercial, and you just got to look at the commercial. You know, these retail tenants are hurting, so landlords are going to be hurting, so there's going to be a, a, a real big reluctance for people to go out and build um, new commercial buildings um, so that's going to be affected, and your residential is purely a confidence game, and um, that'll take a while before confidence uh, is installed back in our market. Great. Uh, Morgan, do you have anything to uh, contribute? Yeah, I, I guess um, Peter McCaw is the tier one construction um, firm here, so I'll, I'll leave most of this question to him, but um, yeah, couldn't agree with Peter more. Like, a lot of the industry is about confidence at the moment. There's there's not much confidence there in terms of what the future looks like. There's a lot of lessons that we can learn from uh, 2008, 2009, and and I guess other um, other downturns prior. And we know the market contracts across the board. There's less demand. Um, there's an impact on foot traffic and consumer spend for for retailers, retail and hospitality particularly hit at the moment. Uh, just around all the government restrictions in terms of limiting the spread of COVID. Uh, but yeah, residential, um, I mean, we probably feel the same, uh, dropping 50% plus probably in the very short term. I think there's a lot of people that are just holding back and waiting to see what happens in the market. Uh, like Peter, we work nationally, so we've got projects in areas like uh, Queenstown Lakes, Rotorua and so on. So those tourism areas are particularly um, hit by this. So. I mean, probably the good thing for us here in the Bay of Pliny is uh, we've got, a, I guess, a good diversified economy. We've got a port. We've got, uh, if you look at how town's grown in the last uh, 11, 12 years, I think our economy is a lot bigger, more diversified. Uh, we've got really strong primary industries and so on that should continue to go. So it's certainly a good place to be, uh, better than many other areas. Peter. Peter McCall. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it is, it is interesting times with the news of Fletcher's, and it'll be interesting to see, to see how that unfolds. Um, uh, uh, Morgan and Peter um, sort of um, touched, on, touched on the history there, um, and if history has taught us anything, it's, it's, it's how long the tail's going to be. So um, if we look back to 87 and um, the share market crash, which was a short, sharp jolt, which um, sent the sent the economy plummeting um, and in the construction sector there were there were probably 40 tower cranes on the skyline in Wellington um, when, the, when the 87 share market crash hit. Three months after that there were still 40 tower cranes. A year after that there were still 40 tower cranes. Three years later there were none. Um, so 
it really is going to be a crystal, I think Morgan used the term crystal ball. Um, it really is going to be crystal ball stuff. Um, the government stimulation, we'll see, we'll see what we'll see what happens there. That that could see a lot of projects hit the market and keep people going. So um, um, yeah, so it, it is really interesting for us at the moment. Um, we we see um, some good projects ahead of us, um, and that's across the commercial sector. Um, but they might be a bit more few and far between, um, and they'll probably be quite hard fought, fought as well. And that's across the whole spectrum, not just for main contractors, but for subcontractors as well. Is there going to be less work? Potentially. And obviously, as Peter said, in the residential market, there's already seen a percentage drop there as well. Um, in other areas in New Zealand, there has been projects gone on hold. There was a lot of work forecast at the Auckland Airport, and that's all been cancelled. So um, those areas particularly um, are hurting that relate to obviously the travel and tourism. Um, and it really is a, a crystal ball game to see how long the tail is and what the effect is on the rest of our industry. Yeah, great. Look, we'll, we'll stay with you, uh, Peter McCaw, and uh, particularly around the commercial sector, I think the, the longest, well, scars or biggest long-term impact would probably be around the commercial tenants, even us ourselves as an organisation, we are looking to adopt the hybrid working from home, working remote policy. Uh, mm. How do you see that affecting the commercial sector in the future? Yeah, that, that, that has been actually, that's a really good point because it has been quite a hot topic. Um, a lot of people have got quite accustomed to working from home and actually say, well, well, this works. So do we actually need the office space that we're, we're currently leasing? So I think it, it's quite early in the game to say that all our offices are gonna now be smaller. Um, that's, that's, it's, it's quite early in, in, in the game for that, but a lot of offices already do adopt the flexible working spaces. Um, um, I, I know Zespri, for example, they've got multiple employees and their, their head office doesn't cater for all those employees all at once because they're not all there. So, um, so already working environments are becoming a lot more flexible. Is there going to be a, um, a, an increase in that? Are our offices going to become smaller? Um, really good question. It's, um, but it, yeah, it's still very early in the, in the piece. But I imagine there are a lot of businesses out there, business owners, um, especially some of the big corporates who are looking at that, looking at how working from home, working smarter, um, and how that affects um, the space they're going to need in the future. Great. Um, Morgan, from your, from your point of view, uh, do you have, uh, since you manage a lot of tenancies as well, uh, are you hearing uh, word on the ground from commercial tenants that that's what they're looking to um, move towards? Yeah, good, a good question, Matt. Um, I mean, we, part of, part of Eros is we manage um, oh, maybe $100 million of commercial property. So over the last few months, when we thought, oh, here we go into hibernation and having a quiet period of time, we've been busy uh, working on our landlord's behalf on no access clauses for leases and, and working on rental rebates. And I guess sharing the, um, sharing the pain of the impacts uh, so that's that's been busy, and certainly, I mean, for business, uh, not being able to operate from their premises, and and I think we've done in the professional services space remarkably well at at upping stumps within 48 hours, heading home, um, all on the cloud, all on laptops, all on mobiles, and and as an industry, got on with business as well as we could. Uh, so yeah, I, I think now as we go into level level three into level two and look at the future, there'll be a lot of businesses out there saying, well, uh, we've done this well, people have actually proven that we can trust them at home, we can operate, uh, we can cont continue to be professional and service our clients and, and do what we do well. Um, so there will be a growing trend to working from home um, or working remotely more often. I've noticed the traffic's still really great at the moment. So uh, is there the need to urgently race out and, and deliver congestion busting projects? Um, or is that money better spent at the current time on other projects to help the COVID response? Uh, but yeah, in the, I guess in the more medium term, are there companies out there that are willing to sign up to new leases for five, seven, 10 years plus for a new build? Um, 
do they do they have a line of sight to the size of their business, their growth, their uh, their future proofing, and so on? I'd, I'd probably say not right now, um, and we're in a bit of a holding pattern around companies making probably some of those more long-term decisions. We've seen the announcement around the, the Craig's project, which is great. Um, it's been known that they've needed new office space now for a couple of years to deal with growth, but I think wider across the industry, we'll probably see a few people just take a step back before they make some of those more long-term decisions. Yeah, look, um, uh, and it came up at our last thought leadership from the tourism and hospo space where perhaps there's some willingness for tenants to look at either equity sharing opportunities or some other financial incentive to get the landlords buy-in uh, to help reduce the, the rent um, and that, that massive financial barrier just to help um, businesses get back into this uh, CBD. But I don't, I'm not sure if that's uh, the best topic for here for in terms of the construction sector. But um, I was just wondering, Peter, Peter Cooney, um, a number of uh, points have been raised just with our chat now around le lessons learned from the GFC. And of course, uh, you were heavily involved uh, during the GFC, uh, particularly with the council, development contributions, uh, enabling infrastructure. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, us learning from our lessons and what do we need to do to change? Yeah, look, the GFC was, it was, it was a big learning curve. It, it, uh, it, again, it blindsided us like it did this time. I, I think Look, the, um, the, the government have, has just kicked the can down the road with wage subsidies and things. I, I still believe there's going to be some real hurt there. Um, the one thing that we, uh, the one thing I believe that needs to be done, and we should have learned it a long time, it's been, um, it's been harped on for a long time, but there needs to be a lot more collaboration with governments, uh, the Kaiongaroas of, of today, the Crown Infrastructure Funds and councils, and, and they need to, <clears throat> we all need to work together. You know, banks, banks are banks. Um, you know, they're fair weather friends. Uh, they'll be extremely difficult again as we go into these times that are being difficult now. Uh, we know that. Um, and the one, the one benefiting factor we've got is low interest rates. Uh, it's certainly going to help uh, help people probably prolong the pain, um, <clears throat> but also you know allow a lot of people to get through this. But the biggest lesson. <clears throat> And that um, anyone should have learned as, as government. And if they want to keep the industry going, they want to keep it moving, um, they need to get more involved and um, become uh, more joint venture uh, operators than sitting in the background um, trying to be conductors. They need to step up and roll their sleeves up and get involved uh, with the development community. And if they don't do that, I mean, we all know that Tauranga and the Bay of Plenty is you know, our, our council's broke, um, hasn't got any money to invest in a new infrastructure. It needs crown funding. It needs it desperately. Um, the biggest lesson we learned and the hardest lesson we learned in 08, when we had a major downturn, everyone put their head in the sand. They said, we don't need any more land. We don't need, need any more housing. The market's poked. Um, we don't need to do anything. The biggest, the hardest lesson we learned is we, the council's, did not turn around and keep planning for the future. Because my firm belief is that when that vaccine is uh, found, when those borders are open again, you'll see the likes of Bay of Plenty New Zealand go to a whole new level. You'll see growth become extremely strong. Every expat in the world will want to come back to New Zealand. Everyone will see New Zealand as the Switzerland of the South Pacific. And there'll be a huge... Um, um, uh, application for immigration here and to be fair this government spending 200 billion dollars the only way they're going to stimulate the economy is by opening up the gates to immigration so we're going to see some huge growth coming it's probably three or four years away but the worst thing we can do is put our head in the sand and not prepare and plan and get our zoning and get our infrastructure in the ground if we don't do that we're going to be in, in a major world of hurt and you're going to see affordability really skyrocket. Yeah. Yeah, no, th thanks for that, Peter. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of, you, know, you mentioned that the local councils are broke. Uh, is there any thoughts around how uh, public-private partnerships or the way that councils can, essentially councils don't go broke because they know uh, the rates will just go up. Uh, so essentially it's, it's a nice safe investment. Uh, what are people's thoughts around um, using PPPs to help deliver some of these major projects? You definitely need uh, you definitely need a PPP, but 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 
you know, this Crown Infrastructure Fund where they came in and they loaned the council money was off the balance sheet, that's just a targeted rate and it won't work because it affects the very people you're trying to get into housing and it affects the low end of the market because it basically we've done the exercise with Crown Infrastructure Fund on numerous projects and it just doubles their rates. And so it's not a workable solution. But there needs to be uh, greater input uh, from the government. There needs to be the likes of Crown Infrastructure Fund coming in and underwriting developers. So developers can go out and create and borrow private equity, still go to the banks and knowing that the underwrite, the banks knowing that the underwriter is there from the Crown and the developed private sector can get on and doing it using private funding but have that backing from the Crown. Those are the sort of initiatives that need to come out of Crown infrastructure, um, not this targeted rate um, uh, proposal that they've um, been pushing around. Uh, and, and to be fair, it's only been used once and um, I don't think you'll see it used again because the rates just end up being too high. So those are the sort of initiatives that need to come out of the government. They need to be, get in there and back private developers. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll add to that. I, I mean, Peter's absolutely right that from 2008, eight nine. Um, and it continued on for a few years after that as well, that the councils all pulled back, tried to keep rates um, rates down to zero or CPI, whatever that might be. And there's certainly a lot of pressure in the community and, and that's understandable around the ability to pay and the ability to keep increasing rates. But um, I mean, what we need is we need bold, um, probably go big, go large, go quick leadership from local government, from central government um, that actually step into, into the breach now, start delivering projects. Um, the Crown Infrastructure Partners process closed over a month ago. So the ability of government to go quick um, isn't wonderful. Uh, and I'll probably say over the last few years, we've seen, we've seen a, a whole lot of red tape, um, consenting take a long period of time as well. So now's a really great opportunity to actually look at some of the benefits, some of the positive effects of development, of investment, of consenting and say, what can we fast track? Can we fast track our growth areas? Can we push plan changes through? Can we deliver investment that unlocks land? So actually, uh, like Peter said, local government, central government and partners being key participants rather than conductors is what we need right now. Yeah, Peter McCaw, anything to add around government, uh, local and central? Yeah, well, I think um, yeah, all, all good points. And the um, what one thing that, um, Obviously, Hawkins and Downer are part of the, is the construction industry accord, which is something that um, there's obviously a lot of blood on the floor pre-COVID with um, with a lot of companies in distress in the in the construction market. There's obviously it was all through the media, um, you, you know, 12 months leading up to leading up to COVID was the, the the distress that's in the in the construction industry and in the commercial commercial construction industry in particular, and the, and the um, construction accord was set up. Um, and I think, um, like Morgan and Peter have touched on, now's the time for the government to really step up, step, step up and get some traction from um, things like the construction accord. And I think now's the time for the rubber to hit the road in relation to that and really, and really put it to the test. And getting PPPs up and running and a truly collaborative um, environment. Everyone talks about collaboration, but you know, true collaboration where everyone is working together in a trusting open environment is actually quite hard in our industry. So if we can actually get that up and running now, now's the time and get some real good traction quickly, that would only bring, only bring a positive, positive outcomes for where we are at the moment. So, um, yeah, I think all, all, all good points, but the thing is, if the government can really step up, that'd be great. Yes, so there's been, um, uh, previously over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of talk around, there's too much risk in the, in the tender process uh, and the better sharing of that risk. Uh, Peter Cooney just mentioned around governments uh, underwriting uh, some of these larger firms, uh, yeah, these larger tenders. Uh, what else needs to happen in terms of these tender processes, sharing the risk, uh, and has the government heard, uh, and are they likely to implement? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, that was certainly a big, a big contributing factor, the level of risk and the contractual risk that's passed 
down the line. Um, and we have seen a little bit of change in relation to that through the construction accord. Um, has it got the traction that it should have? Probably not. Is there still a long way to go? Yes, there is. So um, can that happen quickly now? Well, that, that's, I suppose, the question on everyone's, on everyone's lips. Government departments like the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Justice, uh, the Ministry of Education's, um, they're, the, they're the biggest client in New Zealand in terms of the commercial um, construction. So um, it'll be very interesting to see how they react in terms of um, the, the level of risk that um, they're, they're now implementing within the market. So again, quite early, it's quite early on the piece. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens next in relation to that. Yes, yeah, some of the um, just adding to that, Pete. Oh, you go for it, Peter. No, no, just just adding to that, Pete. I mean, I mean, talking about sharing risk and, and you know fair risk, fair reward. I mean, the governments have had the worst contracts out there from mm. a contractual point of view, and uh, you know they give it lip service, but I can I can assure you, you enter into a government contract. So they'd be the hardest and the worst contracts that you'd enter into. So they really need to pull their finger out and change the way they do business. And just yeah, on um, for sure. on some of that stimulus that's already, I guess, pumping through the veins of the economy at the moment and it's already been announced and is to come is, um, like Peter said, the Ministry of Education and their school building program that they've got, which, which would be ambitious and, and something really great um, with a number of projects underway here. Uh, the DHB funding uh, recently as well, the courthouse funding for Tauranga as well, with the new courthouse here, which will be another major project. Um, so, so we're already seeing that come through. Probably one of the ones that we've missed the boat on is the PGF. And uh, I think other than a million dollars, nothing else seems to have landed in Tauranga, but certainly in the wider district um, and Bay Plenty region, there's been a lot land in, in Kaurau, Whakatane, Rotorua, and, and you look wider. So that government money is coming through. Um, I think one of the sleeping giants that we've got here is, is also the regional council and their balance sheet along with Keyside. So, they're a group who um, they've got a huge balance sheet and it would be good time now to see what could be done with that for the benefit of the region. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I agree totally with that. I think the regional council have been, as you say, they've been sleeping giants for a long time and this is the time they really need to come to the party and uh, they've got the balance sheets and they really need to step up to the plate. They've, they haven't for so long. Um, this is an opportunity for them to, um, and this is where uh, Western Bay, Tarrant City Council and Regional Council need to act as one, and they need to do it for the benefit of the region, not just for each, in, uh, you know, each individual um, area they've got, but they've worked in silos for too long. This is the time they all need to step up, up the plate, unite, and, and do it for the benefit of the overall region. And this is where Regional Council has really let this, uh, this region down, in my view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some some good topics there. I'm just conscious of time and uh, just looking for your own uh, looking at the sector internally. What can the sector do to help uh, the situation? What some of its biggest constraints, particularly now borders are closed, uh, skilled labour and other things, but as well as uh, institutions. What are some of the biggest things that the sector needs to do over the next couple of years? So. I can uh, add to that, Matt. Um, one of the things the government has done, I know there's been a bit of criticism <laughs> during during this this topic, but obviously the um, what they have released is trade trainings are now is now um, an incentive to go and um, I guess re retrain and upskill. Um, so and that's now free of charge. So. That, that's a real opportunity that is presented to the sector. So those um, young people out there have potentially lost their jobs in hospitality um, and in the, in, the, um, in the bars and restaurants and, and tourism um, and the tourism sector as well. They've now, now got the opportunity to go and retrain um, as, as a carpenter or a plumber and get themselves a trade. Um, and like Peter Cooney said, the long-term outlook for, for New Zealand and our region in particular is very positive. It's, it's a lot of people want to come to New Zealand, a lot of people want to come to the Bay of Plenty. Um, so in three or four years time, there is, you know, it is, it is going to be good times again. 
Um, and hopefully it's, hopefully it's not as long as that. So, and we are going to need good people. We are going to need good people and it's people on the ground as well. Um, so through all the, through all the haze, there is, there is an opportunity um, for people to retrain and, and hopefully we can find jobs for them within our industry. Yeah. Um, Peter Cooney, any thoughts on what the sector needs to do over the next uh, couple of years? Oh, look, I think we've all we'll touched on it. You know, we've, we've got a plan for the future and planning for the future is putting infrastructure in the ground. That's critical. That's what led to, uh, you know, uh, affordability issues. If you look right around the country, every council did it. They, uh, they retracted. When the market did turn and it turned really, really quickly and, and it will happen again, we all know how cycles work. Um, we can't afford to get caught short this time. Um, we need to plan and the government and councils need to inject money into infrastructure because we all know that we will go to, you know, you just look at the growth from 4 million to 5 million at the pace it was, New Zealand will, it will happen again and we need to plan, you know, plan, plan, plan and this is a, this is the perfect time for the government, uh, you know, it's a lot of scramble but, you know, they do need to look at the regions where the growth uh, really is and, and invest heavily in infrastructure because we're going to need it. And, and we all know we just can't catch up. When it happens, we haven't got a show of catching up because our Resource Management Act just really limits us. And that's the other thing that seriously needs looking at. That does need to be, both governments have, have talked about it, but no one's done anything about it. And it's time to do something about the RMA. Okay. Um, and I'll, um, you were going to say something. Yeah, just briefly to add to that, I um, agree with all those comments from, from the Peters. Um, I think the RMA is a critical one. So the government's fast tracking their uh, COVID response, fast track consenting provisions that we'll see come in in June, July. So I think that's important. Um, I think it's critical that it doesn't just fast track government projects. So it actually helps the private sector to keep going as well. Uh, there's a mention of housing, but um, certainly a, a wider remit on that to be able to get projects happening and unlock the system is really important. And um, and I mean, the other major one that we've really talked about is collaboration and partnership. So three councils that we've got here in Tauranga working as one um, and partnering with central government and all the agencies. So how do we bring Kainga Aura, um, uh, new schools, new investment, everything else together, infrastructure. I see something in the news today about the town and plan finally going ahead. So really pumping investment and giving the region certainty um, in what should be, whether it's six months or two or three years of uncertainty. Correct. Okay, look, um, I might just uh, grab your final thoughts uh, from e all three of you. Uh, we've covered off uh, the access to labour, um, access to capital, both uh, government as well as lightly touched on some of the banks. And of course, uh, what the sector needs to be doing in terms of its planning and uh, regulatory framework. Look, I, I might start with Peter McCaw. Just getting your final thoughts on, is there something that you want to uh, share that we haven't touched on yet that's top of mind for you? Yeah, um, I, I think I think we've covered a lot of ground, Matt, and it, it, it's good. I think um, I guess final thoughts from me. I think there are a lot of bad stories out there, and um, when we, when we all can be quite negative, some of it can be um, self fulfilling. So um, I think it's a, it's important to keep a balanced lens on um, on what we're looking at for the future. Um, Peter Cooney said it, the, the long-term prospects uh, for the region are actually very good and it all depends how we're going to react over the, over the next, you know, three months, six months, 12 months and how, and how quickly we can rebound out of this. Um, it's uh, it, a lot of it's to do with um, how positive we can be in the market um, and the opportunities that we can bring to the market um, through all sectors as well. So. Um, yeah, I think uh, keeping a positive lens on it is important. Um, although we do, we do, we do learn from the past. So um, yeah, so that's probably probably it from me. Great, Morgan Jones. Final thoughts from you. From you? Yeah, um, I, I'd probably say that, uh, and we've seen it, like I said, through all the negotiations that have been going on with with tenants and landlords over the last couple of months. Um, and all the discussions with government and how we respond to this and how industry and, and where we've got active sites that are under construction, how the developers working with the builder and so on. 
but so I'd, I'd probably say the biggest thing is, is how we pull together as a community, pull together as an industry. Um, it will really determine what that looks like for the next couple of years. And, and I'd probably say that from everything we've seen so far in the last few weeks, um, or last two months has been really good. We had one of our clients call us over the weekend and say, I've got a, I've got a vacant commercial building. Can I set up a not-for-profit and make it available for skills training and for government at free of charge? So I, I think we've got a really good community with a lot of people out there who will step up and be part of the response. So. Um, Collaboration, pulling together is probably the, the biggest message on what we need to focus on for the next few months. Yeah, and a lot of uh, out of the box thinking. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, Peter Cooney, final thoughts from, from you? Yeah, look, the uh, words have been used many times collaboration. And I think, you know, over the years, and if I look over the last couple of decades, the development community has never really been good at uh, collaboration. Uh, yeah, we've all sort of gone our own ways. Uh, for obvious reasons, but I think it's an opportunity. I mean, you look at the building industry, you know, to a certain certain degree, they sort of collaborated and sort of started to work together, you know, like their housing accord, et cetera. I think, I think there's a great opportunity for, the, you know, the, the key development community to start working together as a team in conjunction with, with councils and, and the government. And I think if we can sort of start to create that thinking that, you know, um, it is, it is a collaborative approach. You know, there's, there's enough out there for everyone. And um, if we all work together, I think we can all, you know, sort of um, hold hands and get through this and, and, and get a lot more people through this um, phase that we're going to go through. So collaboration, I think, is, is, yeah, is the ultimate key here. Yeah, and good, clear, crisp uh, communication yeah, as part of that collaboration. Yep, well done. Look, thank you very much uh, uh, to our panellists, uh, Peter Cooney from the, the Classics uh, Group, Morgan Jones from Veros, and Peter McCaw from Hawkins Construction. Uh, thank you to all the attendees, and, of course, we'll put this up on YouTube later. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your time.